Thank you very much, Mark, for the introduction. And thanks for the opportunity to present our collaboration with Life Technologies here today. So we, the title of my talk is Creating Integration-Free IPSCs and NSCs to Model Parkinson's Disease. This is the project overview and outline to show you what the power is of IPS reprogramming. First, I talk about the background of Parkinson's disease and also our collaboration um, between the Parkinson's Institute and Life Technologies. And then the next part is the generation and characterization of IPS cells from Parkinson's affected donor lines using the Sendai tools from Life Technologies. The third part is the generation and characterization of NSCs and neurons using the new neural induction media from LIFE. And lastly, I talk a little bit about the gene editing tools that LIFE has. So the partnership between the Parkinson's Institute and LIFE Technologies is leveraging um, the capabilities of LIFE Technologies. And we think it will greatly advance the mission of the Institute, which is finding the cause and also better treatments for Parkinson's disease. So Life Technologies has a whole um, variety of products that we try to apply here. And it has been really a pleasure for the last year and a half to work with the folks from Life Technologies to use all those tools to apply them to our donor fibromyalgia cell lines. These are the ultimate goals that we have. So we want to try to understand the molecular basis of Parkinson's disease better. We want to identify compounds that can impact disease phenotypes and ultimately to find drugs that can effectively treat the disease. So this is the background on Parkinson's disease so that you get an idea what disease we are working on. It's a neurodegenerative disorder affecting about 1 to 2 percent of the population over the age of 65. We see cl clinically cardinal features of Parkinson's disease, which includes the resting tremor, the slowness of movement, and muscle rigidity. Pathologically, you see a loss of dopaminergic neurons in the brainstem. And what's characteristically pathologically are inclusion bodies known as Lewy bodies. OK, so the power of IPS technology and modeling Parkinson's disease in a dish allows us to take skin from a patient with a disease doing the reprogramming to get into a pluripotent state, and then differentiate the cells into a tissue type of interest, and in our case, neurons, neural stem cells, and mature neurons. So once we have this model in a dish, we can then use it for disease modeling, looking for disease mechanisms and phenotypes, and ultimately, this lays the foundation for drug screening. So getting to the next part, which is the generation and characterization of IPS cells from Parkinson's donor cell lines using the Sendai reprogramming kit. We had um, a poster last night on that. I hope you had a chance to take a look at it. So the Sendai virus is um, addressing a lot of the major challenging challenges that we have for reprogramming. So first, the integration of the virus into the genome. It has a really high efficiency for hard to reprogram cell types. And it's fairly easy to use, so you only need um, one transduction um, to get to your IPS lines. It's an RNA virus, so um, it replicate, replicates exclusively in the cytoplasm. It's non-pathogenic, and it has a broad tropism. So those were the advantages, and that's why we chose the Sendai. Here you see the workflow using the Sendai. So you plate your fibroblast at different cell densities. So we used 50,000 to 200,000 cells, then transduced the cells with Sendai. Then those cells were cultured for seven days in DMEM FBS media. After seven days, we replated those cells on inactivated mouse embryonic feeders, and then switched to HGSC media. By day 20 or so, we started to see colonies, and we picked individual colonies between day 20 and 26, expanded them, and then further characterized those IPS cells. Here I wanted to show you the reprogramming efficiency and how it varies widely across those lines that we've reprogrammed. So we had six different lines, four Parkinson's lines and two control lines. And what we've seen is that 
we have some lines where we really got a very low efficiency, only three colonies or um, a, a efficiency of 0.006%. And some lines reprogrammed really, really well where we had an efficiency of 0.3%. We think that has to do probably with the age of the donors. So this case was a young individual um, at age 19 at the age of, bi uh, of biopsy. And then these lines are fairly, um, a fairly severe cases, so this is a double mutation, and multiple sy system atrophy is a very fast progressive form of Parkinson's disease. So we think these could be the, different, um, the reasons why we see these differences. So then we started to characterize the lines. We looked at the um, pluripotency markers, and we saw all the expected pluripotency markers by immunocytochemistry and also flow. So OCT4, TRIAL181, TRIAL160, SSEA4, so the surface markers. And also here we have non oc expressions using ICC and flow. Next, we made sure that we don't see any more re residual Sendai virus, so we used a live um, kit to detect the, the virus. So here, seven days after reprogramming, you have a nice expression of the Sendai, but here by passage 12, all the Sendai is gone. You can't detect it anymore. We also did an embryo body differentiation assay to look at all, all three germ layers. So we were able to show that we can derive tissues from the endoactor and mesoderm. And we wanted to make sure that the karyotype that in these cells are still normal. Here we used a 609 gene panel from Life Technologies looking for pluripotency and also differentiation genes um, based on the, um, on the guidelines from the stem cell initiative. And we've seen that all the IPS cells clustered nicely together and the, also the um, original fibroblasts clustered together, together. Of note is that the fibroblasts show a more heterogeneous pattern of, um, of expression, whereas the IPSCs are a lot more homogeneous. Here we pulled out a set of pluripotency markers, and what we've seen across the line, uh, alliance is that they express fairly consistently. Okay, so what we've used here is um, based on the scorecard panel that Alex Meissner is going to talk about in the next talk after me here um, in the live innovation showcases, and um, so stay tuned and stay for his talk. So the third part is the generation and characterization of neural stem cells using the new GIPCO PSC neural induction media. And we had one poster on Wednesday night, and there's another poster tonight if you're interested and if you have more questions about it. So the neural induction media is really greatly simplifying the workflow. So nobody in my lab wants to use the embryo body method anymore because this is a lot easier. So I can't convince anybody to, to go back. So we have a high efficiency of neural induction in only seven days. It really eliminates the need for embryo bodies and rosette picking. And this is all in adherent culture conditions. It's very scalable, so you can start with um, a million cells. And then at the end of this process, you have more than 20 million cells that you can bank up. It also enables really modeling the brain, so you, can ha you have a high expression of the neural stem cell markers that you expect. And we've also shown that we can differentiate those cells into um, neuronal and glial types. This is the workflow. And we have a PD line here and a control line. These cells were all adapted to the essential aid media, but we've also tested other feeder-free conditions, and we've also um, successfully used these um, cells and the neural induction on mouse feeders. So over the first four days, you still see colonies, and you don't see much of a morphological change. But then day, day six or seven, these, the colonies are, are growing these alien limbs, which, which look kind of funny. And then on day seven, you use um, acutase, dissociate them, replate them on gel tracks, um, and then you have adherent cultures. Here you see the representative NSC morphology of the resulting cells. And they look very much like the EB-derived um, NSCs. 
We've done characterization of those neural stem cells and they show the expected markers using immunocytochemistry and um, flow. So they are all nestin positive, SOX1, SOX1 and PAC6 positive, but we can't detect any OC4 or nano in those cell cultures. Here again we use the 609 um, gene expression panel and we see here that the NSCs cluster nicely together, whereas here you have all the IPSCs. So we have really um, derived the NSCs and we have a dis, um, distinct cell population here. These are our attempts to differentiate those cells into mature neurons and we have a control line here and an MSA line. Um, looking at day 58, we see tyrosine hydroxylase, we see TOJ1, we have also LMX1A as midbrain transcription factors and FOXA2 that we get. This is the multiple system atrophy line, so we can do it in controls, but we also can do it in disease lines. These are our, um, this is our protocol to differentiate into astrocytes. Um, this is what we get after day 22 in, in astrocyte induction media. Um, and we see CD44 positive cells, which is a glia progenitor marker, and we also get GFAP here. Now going to the last part, and I think I have enough time, which is the genome editing of a gene that is very important for Parkinson's disease, alpha cell nuclein. I've mentioned previously that this is the main protein that you find in Lewy bodies of the disease. Um, but in this case, it's from a patient who has multiple system atrophy. We also here had a poster um, two nights ago that showed a little bit more in detail what we did. So just a background on multiple system atrophy. It's also um, called the Parkinson's Plus syndrome because it has additional features of Parkinson's disease. So it's a new degenerative disorder with autonomic failure and motor impairment. The prevalence is a lot less than Parkinson's disease. It's two to five per 100,000. The average age at onset is a, is a little younger than for Parkinson's disease, so it's 55. Um, but it has a much more severe and faster course. So the average survival is nine years after diagnosis, whereas with Parkinson's disease, you can have 20, 20 or more years. There's no really known genetic basis or risk factors for MSA, there are a few SNPs in the alpha synuclein gene that have been shown to be associated with the disease, and it really rarely runs in families. Unfortunately, those patients poorly respond to standard dopamine replacement therapies, so it's very difficult to, treatment, to, to treat them, so there's a great need to find novel and better therapies. And then, Pathologically, we see alpha synuclein glia cytoplasmic inclusions, not like the Lewy bodies um, that are in the neurons, but here we find them in glia. So what we wanted to do here is we wanted to knock down alpha synuclein and see how, if, how that influences the pathology. So just a background on um, talonucleases. Talons have two domains, one functional domain to cut, um, the DNA and then one DNA binding to main to recognize the region of interest where you want to um, cut. And then if you don't have a homologous donor DNA, the cell repa re repairs the cut and in some cases you introduce small insertions or deletions which results in a gene disruption. If you have a, a homologous donor and then what you can you can show us you can get a replacement of the DNA by homology directed repair. So this is the workflow. It's fairly easy. You can um, order a talent nuclease based on your target sequence. Then you test if your talent works in, um, in a cell line. In this case, it's an osteosarcoma cell line that we used. And here you see that, that you get these cuts. And then you use the talent in your in your cell line of interest, in your IPS line or other cell line, um, pick clones and then verify the, the change that you're interested in by sequencing. So we were lucky and we got two clones that had a disruption of the alpha synuclein gene here, clone two and clone four, 
and this is the next generation sequencing, and um, this is the this is clone two that we used um, to sequence. And here you see this is the deletion that we achieved. So again, I said there was a poster a couple of nights ago on this. Okay, so now I'm getting to the summary, and I have six minutes. Okay. So what I've shown you is that we generated integration-free iPSCs from four Parkinson's patients and two control donors using the Sendai reprogramming tools from LIFE. It's very easy to use with fairly high efficiency. We characterized all those IPS lines using the new score panel from Alex Meissner. But we've also seen a lot of line-to-line -line variation depending probably on um, the age and disease status of the donors. We are very excited that this new neural induction media is now on the market um, to make neural stem cells. So it's very short and simple workflow. You can bypass the embryo body formation. These NSCs express all the um, known neural stem cell markers, nest in SOX1, PAC6, but no um, pluripotency markers. The NSCs then can be differentiated into glial and also um, um, neurons of interest. And then lastly, we've shown that we can use the, the talent technology by live technologies to, um, to integrate and, and modify certain genes of interest for Parkinson's disease. So what are the next steps? We want to mod mod monitor Parkinson's relevant phenotypes from the Parkinson's disease donors. Um, to the matched control donors and also the derived isogenic lines with talon. And we want to look at the neural stem cells, neurons, and also glial populations um, for um, cellular and molecular phenotypes. So we can use the, the wide um, plethora of tools from life and we can look at just general neuronal health. We want to look at mitochondrial stress for Parkinson's, it's important to look at protein aggregates, also autophagy um, is, is a big disease mechanism of, of interest. And lastly, we can use the gene expression tools from life. So here I want to stop and want to acknowledge the people that have um, done all the work. So from my lab, I want to acknowledge Anne, Ramya, Malini, and Jessica Westphal. They were mostly involved in the neural induction um, part of the program, but really the heavy workload was done by the folks at Life Technologies in Madison, which is Tori, Kuhn, Bonnie, Spencer, Connie, Marion, David, Laurie, Steve, David, and last but not least, Kurt, who's really a great um, person who's holding us all together and getting us, keeping us on track. Okay, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions.